<laughs> so I was also wondering some of the steps in between. So three o'clock in the morning, you've got an idea, and then many months later at eight o'clock, a bunch of people go see a play and they see the costumes. So I was wondering if you can maybe touch on people who touch the costumes. Uh, who are some of the people that make choices? You're sort of saying that as a as a technician, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that there are there are things that happen there. Just for yeah. some of the audience members that aren't necessarily aware of all the steps, yeah. If maybe we could just touch on some of that. Sure. I actually um, I work as a dyer and a breakdown artist at uh, primarily at Soul Pepper, but I have worked at Young People's Theatre in Toronto. Uh, but I've also worked as a buyer in at the Shaw Festival and at Cannes Stage here in Toronto. And part of my job as the buyer uh, was to take designers around to the different fabric places and to look at fabric. And, and it's an interesting process because you get to see a designer's process as far as how they touch the fabrics, what they're drawn to. And you work sort of as an assistant. Um, and then as a dyer and a breakdown artist, you, I then also get to work with the designer once the fabric's been chosen. And if they're choosing to change the color of the fabric or make the fabric look different or break it down, make the costumes look dirty or do something with the fabric. So that sort of, for me, I get, at, I'm very lucky as, a, as an artist to be able to do the design process and then sometimes work as a buyer and then sometimes work as a, a dyer and a breakdown artist. Um, and then a lot of the time you have your head of wardrobe who's the person who facilitates the design and then you also have people like dressers who maintain the costumes during the run, and then you also have the actor who gets involved and has things to say about how the costume fits, how the fabric feels. So from my perspective, that's sort of the type of people that would connect with the fabric. As, um, as a director, usually uh, somebody says uh, in rehearsal, can I have a few minutes? and <laughs> say okay and then stuff gets paraded in front of you um, during Intimate Apparel which was a wonderful show based on fabric right so um, it's one of the things I, I love to talk about so the, the we have to have this wonderful smoking jacket made and so Tamara Kutrin who designed it came in and she had swatches and a book full of the most gorgeous materials, right? And it was great. Sat there and we, you know, and you get to feel really powerful and <laughs> say, oh, I like this one. Oh, no, that one's a little too this. And so we finally came down to one, one fabric and she said, you know, Philip, all these fabrics are a bit expensive, you know, about $55, $75 a yard. I said, you know what, Tamara, let's go whole hog, you know, that's great. And she came back two days later and said, so we bought the material and I sent it off to get it cut and built and said, great. And said, um, it was the only one that was $350 a yard. <laughs> it's oh. beautiful. <laughs> right? Because not only did it make a beautiful jacket, the, the uh, Alec Posh Golden in this show has got to take $700 worth of fabric and go, look, isn't it beautiful? And you go, yeah, that's really nice. Every, I couldn't watch the scene without thinking. <laughs> so that, that particular jacket is probably going to end up at the museum one day. Um, but right now, it lives in my office. Because <laughs> I'm not. Case. It, no, no moths, no nothing. You know, it's like staying there. So it's, it's very different from, from me as a, as a director. Um, getting just, just that stuff there, and then you, you, you're really saying, mm, you know, and, and trying to put it all together. As the actor at, at Stratford, for example, I would go in and um, uh, you did have, I think you have greater clout at a place like Stratford depending on at what level of the hierarchy you come in as. If you come in holding the spear, trust me, you have no say. <laughs> if you come in doing Othello, you can say, no, I'm not wearing that. And you can get away with it, you know, which is kind of hey. cool. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's a very different process uh, down there, and there, and that's that's a much a much bigger machine where you can ask for things and things happen. I mean, you know, these guys are making like you know three four hundred dollars shirts and and fifteen hundred dollar capes, and you kind of go, well, that was my whole costume budget, you know. So <laughs> it's it's a different order of magnitude. Um, I, I think. You know, following along what you're talking about, um, I put my faith in a good cutter. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm always in awe of people who can 
can look at stuff flat in paper on the table and, and turn it into something shapely and wonderful. And, and I'll never know how to do that. Um, so I think that is probably one of the most important, after the choice of fabrics, that's got to be the most important um, thing. And I think, too, that in terms of period costuming, um, the silhouette is always established by a cutter cutting the underwear properly. I mean, you can add all the decoration from Baroque to Victorian. Uh, if the silhouette isn't established by good corsetry and good whatever, or lack of corsetry or corsetry or whatever it is, it's really the cutters, the, the undergarments that set the kind of stage for the, and also I think for the actors, um, movement and the actor's confidence, undergarments, believe me, you you know, I've spent more on undergarments than on costumes <laughs> many, many, many times. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, the cutter, um, and then there are, as you talked about, the people who, who make the three dollar a yard material look like three hundred and fifty dollar yard material. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know any of those. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that, they charge 400 bucks. That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, that's the, 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 you know, that is always the question in a place like Stratford. It, do you, if you chose a cheaper fabric, the labor cost would make it that much cheaper. Yeah. But generally in the more alternative theaters or in the independent theater and the smaller theater, uh, where labor is a lot um, less, you, you certainly can enhance fabric great deal mm -hmm. through the treatment and I admire people and there are some people here tonight who work magic with fabric mm -hmm. so but then and then the fitting which is part of the cutter's job you know the people who do the fitting and mm -hmm. who who um, are willing to to do the detail kind of alteration and the, the um, and and then you know hopefully well we've all had experiences of costumes coming apart, well I have, <laughs> on a very famous opera singer when he bent over to pick up the princess and the trousers. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, um, it happened to me in Paris with dance costumes too, and I think, well, whose fault is it, you know? Um, fitting, cutting, sewing, design, it's like we're all in this, but Let's hope it doesn't That's happen. That's a collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody who touched it, everybody who touched it, no. Can we talk a little bit more about what a cutter does? Because I'm not sure that, that everyone has a, I'm not sure I do, have a strong sense. So like as a designer, you create a sketch, and then what does the cutter do? Well, I think you, um, it, it, it depends. Some designers work with, with very, it depends a lot on what your drawings are like, I think. If you do very loose drawings, then as a designer, you're sort of obliged to do some technical drawing, which the cutter can then use to actually cut out the garment. Um, but I think uh, cutters work in two basic ways. One is the flat, where they make paper patterns, uh, and then put the fabric you know, on the patterns, cut it out, and put it on a Judy or form, or the draping, which is the other way of doing it, which is taking the fabric and draping it on to the, pretty directly onto, which was started, I think, in the, you know, I don't know, by someone like um, Madame Gray. I mean, that was something that started in the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. when, I was, when I was down at Stratford, um, the dressers who, a lot of them worked as cutters and, and things down there as well, had a whole litany of what color thread was used for basting. And it was sort of like little <laughs> rhymes, like if you baste with green, it'll never be seen. And, and, and there was a, I'm like, how did, who made this song? <laughs> But it was true, and it was, and it was, and it was quite wonderful, you know. And, and it was sort of like, uh, oh no, no, you can't, you can't use that color, that thread. They have to use this particular thread. And I guess they they developed this kind of whole lexicon of uh, of basting threads. So they're, you know, they're they're interesting down there. <laughs> oh, well, I I think the cutter is the person too that um, is what Astrid was saying is that it's really as a designer they're an ally and you know if you have somebody who's a, a, and they're artists I think cutters are true artists um, and basically there's somebody who 
you work very closely with and have a dialogue with about you know the spirit of what you want as a designer and also they're very good at guiding I mean I think every designer if you have to you use a cutter then basically you're relying very closely on that they'll understand what you want and interpret what you want and it doesn't always come out that way but again it's it's communication and finding a good rapport with somebody and I know especially since I've worked at Stratford is that there are definitely designers who have preferences you know you have a cutter that you have a great experience with and then you have a cutter that you don't have a great experience with or you just connect with somebody and then you know that's somebody that I know certain designers will say oh you know when I go to Stratford I love this person or when I go to Shaw I love this person so it is it is an integral part I think it's a, it's essential part actually yeah great thanks my, can I just add this? My yep. very first job when I came out of school and I came from Vancouver and I came to Toronto um, was at Toronto Dance Theatre and I kind of had an alphabetical list of you know places to apply and I got as far as D which was not bad <laughs> and I, they were on Lombard Street and I was I came into the building and as I was going up the stairs a woman came down the stairs yelling, that's it, I'm gone, I quit, I'm finished. <laughs> so so I went up and there I was with my very slim portfolio. <laughs> and the general manager said to me, what do you want? And I said, um, I'm a designer, I want to design here. <laughs> and uh, he, said, he said, can you cut dance costumes? And I said, Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that was at a time when Toronto Dance Theater was very big, and they were very, um, they were doing big shows and big theaters with big, you know, shows and stuff. And I had, didn't have a clue, but I, I <laughs> taught myself at night how to do it. In the first few <laughs> costumes, the dancers couldn't move, <laughs> rip. But, <laughs> But I, I did learn. So all in, the point of this story is only that it is very helpful if a designer has some understanding of cutting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you can't do it, at least you, you, you have some understanding. Yeah. Right. So you don't use upholstery yeah. fabric for dance costumes. No. <laughs> you learn that. Not twice. And that, <laughs> and that person coming down the stairs was Susan McPherson, who probably a lot of you know was a dancer, but she also doubled in those days as um, costume designer. So. Um, I was also wondering, we sort of talked a bit about fabrics and whether or not, like is it easier to play a king if you're wearing actual silk? Does it matter to the people on stage whether or not you spent the three hundred fifty dollars? <laughs> Over to you, uh, Phil. You, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a mixed blessing because an actor when he gets a costume or she gets a costume and it's all silk and, and it's like oh wow you know I'm here I'm cool and that lasts until about the fifth performance <laughs> then it's like what do you mean I can't have a cigarette in this or I can't have a coffee or you know what I mean so then then it takes on a life of its own. Um, I've, been, I've been an actor since, I don't know, too long, um, so 30 odd years. And I came out of the dressing room one night um, after Othello, and, and it was a hard show. And I, I had my little, my little um, dressing room was on the stage, at the back of the stage, and so it, they call it Hut's Hut. And I, I, I kept trying to tell them it was Aiken's Annex, but it <laughs> wasn't going anywhere. So I came out, and, they, and, and the dressers were there, and they said, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine. I said, boy, I could use a drink. And I said, Do you have any, you know, boy, I could use a shot of vodka. And they handed me the spritzer bottle. <laughs> and I said, well, wait, wait, you giving me water? And they said, no, it's vodka in there, right? And I said, what do you use the vodka for? And they said, well, for cleaning the, un the, the costumes that you can't dry clean. Pit stop. Your little pit stop, right? So it was, it was all vodka. <laughs> so I didn't know this, but it was pretty cool. Johnny Goad, who was playing Yago, had a kind of an over mantle and it was leather and fabric and 3,000 metal studs <laughs> in it. So it, it weighed a lot and it couldn't be dry cleaned. And I think they used up half of the vodka production of Poland <laughs> on this vodka. But it didn't matter because by the end of the run, the last two to three weeks of the run, it smelled so bad. 